test. Okay, let's do the phone. online assistance from experts. And uh, the CDC has a lot of good information about that. But in any case, no matter how you set this up, there has to be one person who is accountable. And that is the person who takes ultimate responsibility for implementing and monitoring and ensuring the success of the program. Next slide. The second element is that you must have mandatory policies and procedures. There's no other way to make this succeed. Um, I mean, education works up to a point and uh, asking works up to a point, but what you really need in order to, to have an impact is policies and procedures that are adhered to. Next slide. Then, obviously, to know if you're headed in the right direction or you're making any impact, uh, somebody has to keep track of uh, how you're doing in terms of um, disease resistance and adherence to your program. And then this information has to be conveyed to all the staff that are participating in the program. Next slide. And the people who are uh, most impacted, the prescribers, need to be able to see the results of the program. Uh, they may need help uh, in supporting their decisions and in communicating uh, their decisions to their patients. And the second arm of this is that the public itself needs to be educated about antibiotic usage. Uh, the CDC has some good programs that can help with that. Uh, their most recent uh, has been renamed Be Antibiotics Aware, Smart Use, Best Care. But, but they have a lot of information that can be used as handouts or as talking points uh, in a clinical setting. Next slide. Well, this is an example of one of the CDC's uh, handouts that talks about the differences between bacteria and viruses and uh, when antibiotics are needed. And they, they have several others. Next slide. So you don't have to invent all this uh, yourself. The example I'm going to use is a uh, levofloxacin or Leviquin. It's a, a fluoroquinolone. It's been around for quite a while now. It's a, I picked it because it's a commonly used, relatively expensive antibiotic with a, with a lot of applications. Uh, it's widely prescribed. And because of that, of course, uh, widely prescribed inappropriately, used both in hospitals and outpatients. Uh, it's, it has a, a pretty good spectrum. It's highly active against strep pneumonia, as well as pseudomonas and other gram negatives. So this makes it a good one for community acquired pneumonia. Uh, it's also good for uh, severe sinusitis, complicated urinary tract infections, uh, some intra-abdominal infections, acute prostatitis. So it's a very useful antibiotic. Next slide. The problem, of course, is that especially a lot of these respiratory illnesses, uh, probably the majority of them are, are ab actually not caused by bacteria. Most sinusitis and bronchitis is viral. Antibiotics aren't really needed. And when they're prescribed, um, then bacteria are exposed to these and they can develop resistance. So for respiratory illnesses, um, it's recommended that it be used only if you have greater than three days of fever. And by fever, it's not the patient's self-report, but documented temperatures, uh, a significant fever, 102 Fahrenheit or above, or an illness that fails to improve after 10 days, which would be sort of a typical viral course, or one that initially improves and then worsens again with these other signs such as fever. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, 
Um, I, I hear often that uh, people prescribe antibiotics for people with cough if the sputum is colored, but that has not ever been scientifically correlated with bacterial infection. So it's recommended that you use the quinolones only if there are signs of lower respiratory tract infection, which would include tachycardia, tachypnea, fever, abnormal breath sounds, maybe an abnormal chest x-ray, although um, you know you would have to be careful. Um, plain x-rays are uh, easy to confuse congestive heart failure or prior scarring or some other uh, problem with pneumonia. Um, so try and see the whole picture before you prescribe the antibiotic. Next slide. For urinary tract infections, it's uh, things like Cipro, which is fluoroquinolone, and Leviquin are, are used commonly. Most urinary tract infections, especially if they're just simple bladder infections, um, there are simpler antibiotics such as trimethoprim sulfa, nitrofurantoin, or phosphomycin that could be uh, better implemented. And Leviquin should be saved for cases of true pyelonephritis where uh, you have things like the fever, the flank tenderness, uh, and maybe altered vital signs, or if you have a complicated urinary tract infection, like uh, maybe an infected ureteral stone or some other uh, obstructive process going on. Next slide. And levofloxacin interferes with bacterial DNA synthesis, and because of that, it takes a high concentration of it uh, to kill bacteria. It's very effective at it, but it has to be given in a proper dose. And I think one of, one of the things I did wrong for a long time was using too low a dose, uh, sort of having it in my head that I would cause fewer side effects and have less uh, trouble in the long run. And, and that's actually not true. A higher dose is more effective, therefore leading to less resistance. If you kill all the bugs, there, there aren't any left to develop resistance. And it doesn't really make much difference in terms of side effects. The side effect profile looks about the same. Next slide. And another argument against using the fluoroquinolones cavalierly is that they really do have significant side effects, um, especially uh, C. diff, um, resistant strains of C. diff, which can be a, a really bad problem. Um, the fluoroquinolones carry neurologic symptoms, especially in the elderly. You can see delirium and uh, you know trouble walking and other disturbances like that. The tendonitis and tendon rupture has gotten a lot of uh, publicity, but the neurologic symptoms are probably just as prominent. Um, and then also you can see dysrhythmias with QT prolongation. Um, and it's, it's recommended that you not give this concomitantly in a patient who's on amiodarone. Next slide. So as I said, I worked at St. Peter's uh, Hospital for uh, 27 years, and two years ago, they implemented uh, an antimicrobial stewardship program that included having a pharmacist in the department. Next slide. So going back to those core elements that I mentioned, the first commitment, the pharmacy department uh, wrote up a business plan and took it to the administration that included the antimicrobial stewardship program. And that included a, a part-time pharmacist who was actually physically present in the emergency department. Um, they were there during the busiest hours uh, of the day from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., although they've uh, altered that from time to time. But, but basically there was always one there during the busiest time of the day. But it was a big commitment uh, by the administration. Excellent. And they developed uh, policies. So the pharmacist was physically present and they reviewed all the parental orders for antibiotics. Now, if I wrote a prescription, they, they didn't review that. But if I ordered even an oral antibiotic uh, in the ER, they saw that and uh, might, might come over and uh, ask me what I thought of uh, their ideas about it. Or, uh, the parenteral antibiotics, they had to be reviewed and approved by the pharmacist before they were released to the nursing staff to administer. 
Um, and I'll, I'll talk in, in a minute about how all that went. Um, because the, the physicians in the ER had kind of mixed reactions to that. But the other thing here that they did is they reviewed all of the culture results from testing done in the ER. And prior to that, if I say ordered a, a urine culture and then put the patient on whatever empiric antibiotic I chose, and two days later the urine culture comes back and it shows that it's uh, resistant to the drug I had prescribed, you know, the odds are that I wouldn't be working when that came back and somebody would have to follow that up. And we never had a really good system uh, for how to do that. The, it, it typically fell on the physician who was working on that shift, but as you can imagine, in a busy shift, the last thing the ER doctor wanted was for somebody to hand him a handful of culture results from days prior that, that they had to go through and try and sort out what needed to be done. Uh, we didn't really have nursing staff available to do that either. They had other duties, um, but the pharmacist in the department reviewed all those, uh, did the follow-up, found out whether the patient had been treated, whether what they were treated with was uh, something that the bug was sensitive to, uh, and, and if something needed to be done, then they would come and consult with the ED physician working there, but it was much more efficient, and it meant that the follow-up the follow was a lot more thorough and patients were less likely to fall through the cracks. And so that was a big selling point to the ER physicians. Uh, they were willing to put up with uh, having the pharmacists in the department, uh, if for no other reason than that, it took this hassle of follow-up on cultures out of, out of our lab. Next slide. Um, the results of the cultures and the treatment um, are are summarized for the hospitalists and for the inpatient uh, facilities and for the primary care offices that the hospital owns and manages. Um, they were not specifically done for the emergency department. Um, and that was just a decision they made on um, time and best use. Uh, I think it would have been a, a, a good thing, but, but what they did do is uh, they came to our monthly emergency department meetings and they would give us feedback about how things were going. And then we also got an annual biogram. You could get it more often if you wanted it on uh, our susceptibilities. Um, but the point is that we needed some kind of follow-up uh, as to how we were doing. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So this talks about the first two years of this um, stewardship program and our antibiotic usage and then specifically our uh, fluoroquinolone usage in respiratory diseases. So if we saw somebody uh, that we thought had pneumonia or had bronchitis or had sinusitis, uh, did we treat them with an antibiotic and did having the pharmacist uh, in the department make a difference? And so you can see uh, in the dark blue is the first year's experience and in the, the gold is the second year's experience. And our, our first year, uh, our antibiotic usage uh, was around 13%. After the uh, program had been in effect for a year, that fell to 7.7%, pretty much cut in half. And the same is true for fluoroquinolone usage, where we went from 2.6% to one percent zero uh, three percent so pretty dramatic uh, change in our prescribing practices in the box in the upper right hand corner is how we compared to the average in montana and you can see that we were better than the average to begin with and i would like to think that's because we were smarter better er doctors but i know that that's not true uh, in point of fact before they had the stewardship program with the pharmacist in the department, they were already coming to our department meetings once a month and giving us feedback on this. And I think it had already had some impact on, uh, on most of us in terms of our um, prescribing practices. But it, it does show that you can, you can make a dramatic improvement. Um, well, then number four, education. Hey, Dr. Wait, Dr. Kunzweiler, before I... Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to advance the slide. There was a question that I thought I would ask while you were on the slide. Um, sure. Someone asked, where did you get the benchmarks 
I'm sick he's talking about the overall Montana average benchmarks on this. Do you know? Uh, yeah, that, that came from Medicare claims examining and the, I think the Montana Antibiotic Stewardship Collaborative. Um, okay. Got access to those. Okay, thanks. Um, the core element number four, and that is uh, education. The education for us was provided by the monthly department meetings formally, but then informally, uh, the pharmacist was right there in the department, and you know they would come over and talk with you, and uh, and they were always available uh, to answer questions. Um, and I have to say that I was probably one of the less enthusiastic physicians about the program. That is the program of having the pharmacist in the department. Um, and I think that's because I had been in practice for 30 some years and uh, initially didn't feel that I needed adult supervision, but um, it didn't take long for me to realize that it, that it actually was uh, a, a very good service and I appreciated the pharmacist consults, uh, especially regarding dosing, um, but, but also uh, the information they provided. You know, it's so hard to follow all the literature and keep up. We all try. Uh, we all use things like up to date and we all have apps on our phones. Uh, but in the heat of the battle, when you are swamped with patients, uh, it's really nice to have somebody who has the expertise, has the answer, who can just walk across the room and, and give you some advice. And, and so, although I was uh, a little bit skeptical of the program in the beginning. I, I, I left feeling that it was a great service. Next slide. So my uh, suggestions for what they're worth um, for how pharmacists should approach physicians with their treatment recommendations, um, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's a problem that to some extent as, as the value is seen, it, it simply goes away. And as you get to know each other, the problem goes away. But I, I think attitude is really the most important thing. If, if you approach each other in a collaborative mood with the idea that I'm going to provide some educational materials, I'm going to talk about the literature, uh, I'm going to make some, some gentle suggestions. I think physicians are often afraid uh, that somebody is trying to dictate how they practice and we we get that you know all the time from the federal government and from JACO and and you know everybody that uh, doesn't have a, <laughs> a license to prescribe wants to tell us how to do our job and so we are sort of inherently suspicious and maybe a little bit on edge but um, you know once once you uh, have some interaction and you realize that uh, you know, the pharmacists have spent, you know, six years or, or whatever just studying um, pharmacology um, and they are following the literature and, you know, they, they are a really valuable service. I, I think as long as you approach it with a gentle attitude and in an educational format, I think that that problem pretty much solves itself. Um, I do have to say too, they all appeared to be about 15 years old, and so it it, uh, it took a while for me to get used to that and realize that they, you know, that they they really did have a a lot of a lot of training and a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, education, and and so it, it worked out well. The other thing that um, physicians worry about is, you know, how do you communicate with your patients or in particular the parents of patients who feel they need an antibiotic. And this has become sort of ingrained in our society because antibiotics are so ubiquitous and have been used so often. And I think uh, there, are, there are a couple of points that I found to be effective in my practice. And the first was to reassure the families, to reassure the patient that <clears throat> that antibiotic wasn't indicated because most likely uh, this was a viral uh, uh, problem and it was gonna take care of itself uh, and that it's okay to just watch. The antibiotics aren't going away, they are still always going to be available if we need them, but they're not indicated in this. This is almost certainly viral, it's gonna get better on its own. 
And the other thing I would stress is that the antibiotics are, are not without problems in and of themselves and that there can be side effects. And so we don't want to use them unless we have strong indications. And, and then the last motivator uh, is, is money. They're expensive. And if you can uh, come up with other alternative treatments that are supportive, that don't involve antibiotics, you know, you save money, you, you lower your risk of side effects, and you can always, uh, you know, fall back on antibiotics if things change. And so I think that's, those are all arguments that you can use with your patients and with the parents of children. Next slide. So in summary, um, we, we need these formal programs if we're going to improve our care, reduce the development of resistant strains, preserve the effectiveness of our antibiotic arsenal uh, for you know, years to come. Um, it, it is almost imperative that you have some kind of a formal program to support your use. Education is helpful and uh, you know, but we don't all have time to always know what the best practices are and, and any help we can get in that regard, I think is, is good. And that pretty much concludes my part of the webinar. We have uh, some of the core elements from the CDC, uh, and they've enumerated these for hospitals, for critical access hospitals, and for nursing homes. We can take a look at those. Next slide. So, as you can see, there's more than four. The four that I talked about, when you look at them, they sort of just break the same thing out differently. Leadership's commitment, accountability, somebody who has expertise, and then you need actions to support the use. You have to have policies and procedures. You have to have somebody monitoring that. You have to track it. Uh, you have to see what's happening with your development of resistance. And then that information has to come back to the people who are involved in the program. And that has to be done with education. Next slide. Uh, the CDC has some good materials for helping small uh, entities and critical access hospitals uh, develop these. Next slide. And uh, you, know, you can look that up on their website or, uh, or, or use, click on the, the address here. And then, then they have the same thing for nursing homes. Uh, and they're, you know, basically uh, the same, just reformatted a little bit. And then uh, next slide. So Mountain Pacific has been involved in the Antibiotic Stewardship Collaborative. And uh, I actually haven't had much to do with uh, that program. Patty, would you like to talk about it? I sure will. Thank you so much. Uh, before we do, like this jumps into additional information. Is um, Does anybody have any questions if you want to chat? Uh, that would be great. I'm going to try to unmute all the phones. If we don't get a ton of feedback, um, I'll keep them unmuted and we'll see. If you have any questions, please speak up. So you, everybody should be unmuted now. So if you have a question, go ahead and speak up. Okay, I think we're good then. I'm gonna mute everyone. Oh, go ahead, Is somebody, does somebody have a question? Okay, I'm gonna mute everyone again. All right. So I'm gonna continue on. Again, uh, this is Patty Kasedna from Mountain Pacific and I'm part of the Montana Antibiotic Stewardship Collaborative. What actually ended up happening was a lot of different organizations received some funding to help Montana hospitals and clinics support antibiotic stewardship. And what we did was everybody had just a sliver of funding with different uh, deliverables required. And what we really did was we felt that if we synergize our energies, not only are we more uh, efficient within our funds, but also much more efficient and effective in the services we can provide the hospitals and clinics in the state of Montana. So the collaborative is made up of the Montana State Department of Public Health and Human Services, the Communicable 
disease, uh, communicable disease and epidemiology departments, I believe. Uh, the Montana Hospital Association, and that includes the Hospital Improvement Innovation Network, or the HIN program, and the FLEX program. Mountain Pacific, uh, part of the QIO. Um, Mo Montana Office of Rural Health, the SHIP funding is um, helping support some of this. And then the University of Montana Pharmacy Program. So if you're a hospital or a clinic and you are on an antibiotic stewardship team and you guys don't, aren't aware of the technical services available to you, uh, whether it's through the HIN program, the FLEX program, the QIO, et cetera, you can actually just contact each, any individual program or um, in, in a couple of slides, you'll see a link to our website. The Montana Collaborative actually has a website and you can contact us directly if you want some help. And actually a lot of the resources uh, that were discussed already are available on that website as well. So some additional stakeholders that we identified as we got into this, we realized there are some other uh, pro, um, other uh, stakeholders that have an interest in this. So in addition, we have these additional stakeholders. They don't necessarily have the funds available to support it, but they certainly have expertise uh, that they bring to the table. So the Montana Healthcare um, Association for Long-Term Care, Primary Care Association, Infectious Disease Physicians Network, the Montana Family Pharmacy Network, uh, Montana Pharmacists Association, and the Association of Professionals in Infection Control. So those are the additional stakeholders that we have at the table. So we're looking really beyond just the, the funding that's currently available, but bringing in um, deliverables or helping create deliverables that's gonna help a lot of different people or a lot of different types of facilities. And the collaborative, what we really do is provide learning sessions and tools to promote uh, CDC's antibiotic stewardship core elements. And there's a link on the, to our, our, our webpage, which has a bunch of resources, old webinars. So the, um, Dr. Kosweiler showed you a copy of the um, antibiotic stewardship implementation guide for small critical access hospitals. We did a webinar series that walked you through that whole implementation guide. So if you're interested in something like that, you can go to the webpage, find the recording of the old webinars. It's still very relevant. The other thing we do is we have a blog that we post where we really, any new uh, tools that we develop or any links we find or any education, upcoming education events, we actually post it out in our blog. And, that should, and if you subscribe to the blog, um, the email, it'll come to you in an email form, so it's very, um, it's not, it's not like you have to remember to go out to our website all the time. It's very um, reactive, and it actually shows up in your email if you register. So those are, um, I encourage you to go do that. Um, and then you can, if you are part of the HIN program or the FLEX program, you can contact, you can con um, contact your um partners at Montana Hospital Association directly, or if you're funded through DPHHS for the Antibiotic Stewardship Program, you can contact them directly if you need any additional assistance. But you could also do it through our website or through the QIO. So, uh, that's, uh, Christy, do you want to cover this slide or do you want me to just do that? Um, thanks, Patty. I'll just go ahead and say, yeah, um, feel free to contact Dr. Kunzweiler if you have any questions as the Chief Medical Officer of, the, of Mountain Pacific. And then Lori Chikoyak um, is the Regional Antibiotic Stewardship Lead for our Mountain Pacific company. So Mountain Pacific covers Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, and Hawaii. And so she is actually the lead of our team. Um, as we work on this initiative in all four of our states and Either her or Dr. Kunzweiler would be more than happy to answer questions along with the resources that Patty also referenced. Okay, so then we can open it up to questions again. Um, I'm gonna, I'll unmute everybody's phone. We'll, we'll take another shot at seeing if anybody has any questions. But also, I don't know, I didn't see any questions that weren't addressed in the chat. Uh, Christy, did you at all? No, I didn't. Okay, so well, everyone's off mute. If you wanna go ahead and um, ask a question, we have another couple of minutes. We'll leave it open for you.
Okay, I'm going to go on then. And the final slide is just a reminder again, uh, the Montana Antibiotic Stewardship Collaborative Resources page, um, and that's a link, uh, it's, it's linked on this slide, is um, all our past education webinar materials, antibiotic steward program implementation guides, um, policy templates, protoc protocol and clinical guidelines are on there, as well as we created a days of therapy antibiotic usage data tracking tool. It's mainly for inpatient and long-term care at this point. We are working on a copy for emergency department and outpatient. Um, and if you subscribe to our blog, you will get notified of when that's available. Um, and then the second link is to su subscribe to the blog. So if you just click on the link, it'll go out there. So after this presentation is done, um, within a day or so, this will show up on our web page. But also, I'll send out a blog post. And if you subscribe, it'll show up right in your email. And it'll take you right to the slides and the recording. So other than that, I just want to thank everyone for attending today. And, and Christy and Dr. Kunzweiler, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And I, I think that's, go ahead, Christy. Well, we just said you're welcome, and we just want to thank everyone for joining as well. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you, everyone.